This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. And I'm your co-host, Estalia Shenlin. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about their books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll down to the bottom and click on a big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. We are counting on you. You can also leave comments on any given episode by going to our show notes in your podcast app and writing to us or responding to other readers. This episode is sponsored by the Israel Office of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. It's part of our series on democracy, populism, and authoritarian trends around the world. Our guest today is Cristobal Rivera Caldwasser. He is a professor at the School of Political Science at the Diego Portales University in Santiago de Chile and an associate researcher at the Center for Social Conflict and Cohesion Studies. He received his PhD in political science from the Humboldt University of Berlin in 2008. And his main area of research is comparative politics with a special interest in the ambivalent relationship between populism and democracy. We have that same special interest as well. He has worked as a research fellow at the University of Sussex, the Social Science Research Center in Berlin, and the Human Development Group at the Chilean Bureau of United Nations Development Program. Together with Kas Muda of Georgia University, he's the co-author of the book we'll be discussing today, Populism, a Very Short Introduction, published by Oxford Uni- University published by Oxford University Press in 2017. It's been translated into Catalan, Dutch, French, Greek, Japanese, Portuguese, and Thai. And this is uh, his fifth book. And we want to welcome you, uh, Professor Kaltwasser, to the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. So you are a prolific academic, but this book is a very specific kind of book. It's a short, popular version about populism. What is the intention of a book like this? Is it to try to make the ideas that sometimes are confined to the academy more accessible to regular people, maybe even the populists themselves? Yes, I think the idea of this book, as you mentioned before, I have been working with Kas Mude, a good friend and colleague of mine, and we have been doing a lot of research on populism in comparative perspective, which means trying to understand the similarities and differences between populism in the United States, Latin America, Europe, etc. But as you probably know, we are in academia, we tend to write complex papers with data, etc., So something that is not very accessible. And the idea of this book is to translate many of the ideas that have been developing with CAS, but also from other colleagues that have been working on populism in different areas of the world, try to bring that together in this short introduction, in which, on the one hand, we try to present a definition that is useful for understanding populism across time and places, and at the same time, it's useful for understanding the ambivalent relationship between populism and liberal democracy. So, In summary, what we try to do is to bring to the broader public our understanding in academia about this phenomenon that it's getting more and more common in different places of the world. What what do you think the lay public, I mean, your target audience, get wrong about populism? Well, one of the things that we realize is depending on the audience, and by this I mean the regions, there are different understandings that from the academic side are not necessarily the right ones. For example, if you go to Western Europe, people tend to assume that populism is about xenophobia for obvious reasons, because we normally talk about populist radical right parties that are xenophobic. But as we probably will discuss later on, xenophobia and populism are two different phenomena. I'm coming from Latin America. And if you ask someone or a journalist in Latin America what is populism, they will tell you normally it's economic mismanagement because it has to do with a tradition of certain leaders that have been populist and they have done certain things for the economy that are pretty bad. And last but not least, for example, in the U.S., normally there is also a bit this idea that populism has to do with overspending, for example. And As we will discuss, all these things sometimes go related to populism, but are not the same than populism. Well, I'm really looking forward to getting into the uh, particular manifestation in Latin America, which I think is also overlooked. But let me get back to it because I want to start with your overall uh, conceptualization. Um, You make the argument that it is a thin ideology attached to thicker ideologies like fascism or communism. And I I was thinking of all the metaphors in my head, uh, like a magnet that attaches a particular kind of ideology to the public or a battery or a bacteria. <laughs> How do you explain this notion of thick and thin ideology and what is the relationship between bigger ideologies and the public yes. in which populism plays a role? Well, the first thing what 
I try to avoid, uh, and we try to avoid in the book, is to use the medical metaphors that you already used. This idea <laughs> is a virus. <laughs> don't, 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 it, I said bacteria, to be fair. Yes, but okay, it, point true. taken. But the point is, normally when you say that populism is a virus, a bacteria, whatever, then we are assuming that it's something bad. And well, I also said battery. Yes. Well, that's true. It depends how you frame it with the medical metaphor. So I'm not saying that you're necessarily using it in that way, but this is something very common. And I think some of the issues that we try to do in this book is to say we need to be a bit agnostic, try to present a definition, and based on that definition, try to undertake empirical research to look at the different cases. And probably, if you ask me, I would say in many cases, it has a negative consequences on democracy, but not in all the cases. But let's go back to your question about thin and thick. Uh, one of the ideas that we develop in this book is that populism is a thin center ideology. It sounds a bit complex, but if you want, it's a sort of micro ideology in comparison to macro ideologies are much bigger. Bigger ideologies offer answers to almost all political questions that we can pose. Micro ideologies, which are narrower to a certain extent, offer certain answers to certain questions. But this is why these micro ideologies, nationalism, fem feminism, for example, are examples also of micro ideologies or thin ideologies, normally appear attached to other ideologies. And this is why populism very often comes in a right-wing version or comes in a left-wing version, because populism per se is neither left-wing nor right-wing, but populism in practice appears attached to something else, to another ideology, and because of that, it moves either to the left or it moves either to the right. So what are those focused questions that populism addresses? Well, the definition that we advance here, and to be honest, this is our definition, but I think there are many other colleagues in political science or in the social sciences that are using similar definitions. We are saying that populism is a thin third ideology that considers society to be ultimately separate separated into two homogeneous and antagonistic camps, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and also argues that politics should be the expression of the volonté générale or of the general will of the people. So if you see in that definition the distinction between the people and the elite, it's moral. The people is good, the elite is bad, always. Plus, remember, it's about defending popular sovereignty, which also has a very peculiar understanding of how democracy should work. Uh, so I, I, it seems to me like this definition applies particularly well to uh, Western democracies, which is also what you say in the book, because this robust democratic institutions, the, those that are meant to uh, maintain the checks and balances, are those that are there to confine and limit the uh, sovereignty, to the popular sovereignty, you know, without bounds. So it, it, is it really there, the, 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 the fact that it, it applies in this arena more than anywhere else these days? Well, I think you're absolutely right that the Western European democracies are characterized by having these very strong checks and balances that to a certain extent has to do with the history of democracy in Europe. We know about the history of communism and fascism and because of that, European democracies after 1945 are characterized by having strong constitutional tribunals, also by having the European Union that limits the power of the people. But But I would say these democratic malls were working relatively well for a long stretch of time, for a couple of de decades. But nowadays we are seeing in different places of Western Europe that these democracies are not working that well. And the populist actors, either on the left or on the right, are posing the right questions. I'm not saying they're posing the right answers, but they're posing the right questions. And they normally ask, for example, why is it that the European Union has the right to take certain decisions that we, the people, never decided? If you come from Spain or Greece, the situation is quite dramatic. There is an uh, economic crisis. The European Central Bank tells the people in Greece and, and Spain, you need to implement austerity, but the people don't want that. So is this very democratic? And people would say not necessarily. And then you have Syriza or Podemos, left-wing versions of populism, politicizing certain issues that the elites normally don't understand. But many people on the streets are very angry with the system because of that. But staying on this general question about the elites versus the, the corrupt elites versus the moral people, uh, I think there's so much in that statement. But I want to understand from you whether the the focus of populism is that elites have been revealed to be corrupt. We, we've exposed their corruption and their exploitation of the people, or are they corrupt because they are elite inherently? I, I'd like to perhaps rephrase that question a bit. That and, and, and be ask, my guess. Why did it not happen before? I mean, in, in post-war Europe, I mean, this 
kind of you know political constitution that we are living in now has been in place for about 70 years. Why, why is it only in the last few uh-huh, years? Aha, but in your book you take it way back before World War II and then claim that the war, post-war period was a bit of a phase without so much populism. Yes, you have two questions there. The first one is about the issue of corruptness, so to say. And I would say that the populist figures or the populist um, masses, so to say, that support the populist leaders are not necessarily against the elite per se, uh, against certain elites that are corrupt. But here comes the point. The issue of being corrupt, it's subjective. It's not objective. I mean, let's go to the U.S. and Donald Trump. I mean, he's a billionaire. He's part of the elite. And probably he has been done some shady business. So we know that, for example, his tax record, we don't know it, etc. But for many of the supporters, he's not corrupt. Although it might be that we can present a lot of evidence showing that maybe he has been involved in certain corrupt scandals, but the people don't think so. And he's able to frame that the real elite, which is the corrupt one, it's another one. It's the one that is based in Washington, etc. So this whole idea about who are the good ones and the bad ones, it's a construction. So it might be that we can present a lot of objective evidence, but this is not the way in which populism works. So this is part of the story. The second part of the story, you were asking about why is it that populism is new, so to say. And here comes a bit my, uh, I think this is a mistake coming mainly from journalism, that I think journalists... <laughs> that <means> you, Gilad. <laughs> no, What no, are you going to do? No, nothing. No, not against <laughs> you, but I think it's much more that many people started to think that because of the rise of populist radical right parties, and these are relatively new parties in Western Europe, I'm not saying that this is wrong, but many journalists are saying, oh, then populism is a completely new phenomenon. But if you look at the history of many democracies, you will realize that this is not necessarily new. I mean, the word populism comes from the U.S. People's Party at the beginning of the 19th century, a more, more than no, 100 No, but I was talking ago. about the post-war period. Yes. And then if you talk about the post-war period, particularly in Europe, we will realize that you are right. And you, we will see that after 1945, we didn't have almost any examples of populism in Western Europe. Eastern Europe, forget it, because it was communism, no elections, so almost no chances of having populist options. Uh, the only exception we have probably is like in France, uh, that we had like the Pujadist movement in the 70s. This is one of the few examples of populism that we had in Western Europe. Funnily enough, Jean-Marie Le Pen, was involved in the Pujadist, and later on he creates the Front National. So, but let's go back to your question. Why is it that we didn't have populist forces in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? And I would say that part of the story has to do with the history of democracy in Western Europe. After 1945, that democracy was demolished. Many people were so scared, and by people I'm saying, on the one hand, the elites, those who were thinking about the future of Europe, it's not a coincidence that the European Union, it's an elite project. It's not mainly coming from below, it's much more from above. And if you think about the European Union, it was created to a certain extent to tame the people, to have popular sovereignty under control. So, And this worked relatively well for a long period of time three to four decades. But as soon as the European Union started to get more thicker, so to say, or more involved in the political developments, then the populist reaction or backlash, so to say, started to pop up in the 80s and 90s. I was curious uh, when you made that comment, when when you wrote uh, that it wouldn't have appeared so much in Eastern Europe because it was under the communist bloc. And that kind of reinforces the point that populism, in your view, is is in a way, a reaction to a certain kind of democracy or only exists in relation to democracy? Can there be such a thing as an authoritarian regime that gives rise to populism? That doesn't seem logical. How do you see the relationship? It's difficult because, remember, the definition that I'm saying is this moral distinction between the people and the elite, but very important is the defense of popular sovereignty. And the ability of people to criticize that elite. Exactly. If they don't have the space to criticize it. So this is yeah. why populism normally, there are some exceptions, but normally pops up in democratic system. Because people, some people, not the whole people, but some sections of the electorate are angry with the establishment. And they use the democratic tools to criticize the establishment. They develop a new political parties using for example, this populist rhetoric. If you have a full authoritarian system, 
the chances that the people might be able to react and construct a new political party are almost zero. This is why once you have established an authoritarian system, it's very difficult to create a populist option, so to say, unless you have like mass demonstrations, for example, and it could be the case that in this mass demonstration, some populist slogan could be used to criticize the authoritarian regime. But normally it's the other way around, that you have a democratic system, then you have these populist actors that start to attack the establishment. But it's a second question, what happens when they come to power? It could be the case that then democracy goes into the direction of authoritarianism. Okay, let's now go to your home turf, to uh, <laughs> Latin America. Um, going back to my question earlier about the validity of uh, you know robust liberal democracies, Latin America is not famous uh, for that issue in particular, and therefore the understanding of populism in in South America is quite different. Can you take us through it and and perhaps explain how it sheds light on the broader question? Yes. I mean, you're absolutely right that if you take the history of Latin America, I mean, the modern history of Latin America, you will say liberal democracy, it's possibly the exception rather than the rule. But if you compare Latin America to other world regions, we have like a long history of democracy, not the liberal version. And by this, I mean having relatively free and fair elections. And this means, for example, the possibility of the opposition to organize and compete in elections, which is different in, in comparison to the Middle East or Eastern Europe, etc., in which for long periods of time there was no democracy at all. So, but here comes the part, this is not the liberal version. And because this is not the liberal version, very often also because in Latin America you do have high levels of economic inequality, it's very often that then you have a populist actor, more normally from the left, but not only, that will criticize the establishment. And once these actors come to power, they will try to capture the state and move the state into a certain direction, not necessarily through democratic means. And so the liberal component will diminish, although the very minimal version of democracy might exist with certain problems. This is the history of Argentina, for example, if you think about Peronism. So Peron was elected in a relatively free and fair competition. He comes to power, but then he starts this process of state capture. And after a couple of years in power, so the system in Argentina starts to move slowly towards authoritarianism. So maybe the Latin American uh, example and you run, you go through a lot of them, are um, highlight for us something that I think has been, uh, you know, um, an issue that I suspect is behind other uh, populist waves, which is economic inequality. And the Latin American case is very stark. Do you think that's an underlying condition that is in place when populist regimes arise? It's complex. I tend to be skeptical about having like one general argument. No, I meant is that but, one of the factors that we often but see. But one of the factors that plays a big role has to do with economic inequality for the simple reason, and if you go to Latin America, you will realize that if you have high levels of economic inequality, the sort of populist narrative will make sense because you will realize that you have an establishment, the second question whether it's really corrupt or not, and you have the people that to a certain extent are suffering because of these levels of economic inequality. So if you have that sort of scope condition and then you have a populist actor kicking in into the system and saying, look at the establishment that is very corrupt and look at we the people that are very poor and we and are the good And a lot of them because it's 90% exactly. of the public is living in poverty. Exactly. So something. if you do have high levels of economic inequality, of course, the sort of narrative developed by the populist, it's going to make sense to a big chunk of the population. But nevertheless, I do think that economic inequality doesn't explain populism in many Western European societies. My favorite example, it's always Switzerland. I don't know if you know, but the most voted populist radical right party in Western Europe is in Switzerland, Schweizerische Volkspartei, between 30 to 35 percent of the population. So when I'm confronting an economist that always tells me, oh, economy is going to explain everything, I say, well, go to Switzerland, in which inflation is under control, unemployment is under control, economic growth is there, inequality has been going a bit up. But why is it that so many people are voting for that party? It has not to do with the economy. It has much more to do with cultural explanations. But this is much more the history of populism in, in developed societies, if you want. Or I would in, also say that it has to do with the political system there because the central government is really relatively weak compared to... Uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit like, you know, the European elections turned on, on the head, right? Because voting for the central government is relatively meaningless, then people really don't really have much to account for. Yes, probably there is a 
peculiar Swiss version of that, but I think the general argument that you see in in the northern part of Europe, so to say, and in the richer societies in Europe, is that populism normally appears attached to the right because of the politicization of what we call nativism, which is the reason why populism moves to the right. Nativism, at the end of the day, if you want this sort of xenophobia, so the understanding that only the natives are the the ones that have to in, inhibit the live within the nation state, so to say. No, I, I'd like to, to pick up on, on what you said earlier about Trump and Peron mm-hmm. and your actual, actual populists that came to power and ask you whether you can develop what happens when, when a populist comes to power because initially populism thrives on its oppositional stance, right? The people versus the elite, the elite preventing the people from expressing their political will. What happens when they are actually in office and can uh, express their political will? And is there like an essential change in the nature of of populism or is it, you know, just the same thing but in a different political context? Let me just rephrase that. How does a populist stay popular? (laughs) Good questions. I mean, the first issue is when a populism comes to power, one of the issues that we say in our book, we need to be careful about political systems. It's quite different if a populist, the leader, comes to power in a presidential system, Trump, then what happens when you have a parliamentary system? Because once you have a parliamentary system, normally we're talking about parties, and parties need to build coalitions. The UK might be an example because of the peculiar electoral system, but if you go to Austria, for example, in which we have seen a coalition between the Christian Democrats and the populist radical right, the outcome is a bit different because there are two parties bringing something else together. But if we talk about the populist leader coming into power, let's imagine Peron or Trump or etc., one of the fundamental challenges is that if you come to power as a populist and if you stay for a long period of time, you are the elite, of course, for us in an objective sense. But you remember, I told you, the issue of who are the members of the elite and the people is relatively subjective. And here, populist actors are extremely skillful. Take, for example, Chavez, who was in government for more than 15 years. I mean, after 15 years, you cannot say that you're not the elite. But he was able to develop a frame by saying, oh, the real elite, it's in Miami. All those oligarchs that went out of Venezuela and are controlling the country from outside. What? It's not necessarily true. They did have some power. I'm not saying that it's not true, but he was controlling the system. But he was saying the economy is not running well because of them. So populists normally are very skillful in trying to present themselves as political outsiders in a way in which the elite, they're not involved with them, and the elite are always the bad one. Think about the discourse of Donald Trump. He's the whole said, oh, let's drain the swamp. I mean, he's working with Washington, of course. I mean, Republicans are supporting him in Parliament. I mean, I mean, the irony of all these people is that they're supposed to be speaking on behalf of some people who are somehow economically marginalized, and they tend to be filthy rich. I mean, Donald Trump, but of course the, Peron, the Perons. Would uh, Evo Morales be another example of this? Yes, kind of- Evo Morales is a bit peculiar because what we were talking before, I mean, populist leaders normally, I would say, are not not real political outsiders. These are people that are well connected to the elite. Maybe that they were not in the front lines, but they were people a bit behind, but with good connections. Evo Morales is completely different because he really comes from below, from an indigenous populist movement, fighting against the system, and he's able to create a lot of popularity and then construct a political party and then comes into power. And making the critique, right, that outsiders and Americans are sort of controlling exactly. our... But in many other cases, it's the other way around. Uh, Gerd Wilders, uh, the PVV in the Netherlands, I mean, he comes from the Liberal Party. He's upset with the party, he goes out of the party and creates his new political vehicle. And this is very often what happens. I mean, these figures, as I told you before, are not necessarily real outsiders. They have connections with the system. So they're not in the top of the elite, but at a certain moment of time, they run amok, so to say, and they either decide to construct their own political vehicles, PVV, or Trump, they are able to hijack an existing institution, the Republican Party, and then move this institution into a certain direction. Okay, I think the contrast between the Latin American examples and the Western European examples are highlighting one of the age-old tensions with with the understanding of populism. One seems to be based on economic marginalization more. The Western European example seems to be based much more on an ethno-nativism of some sort. And so I guess the question is, can you come up with any particular characteristics of populism that Uh, make it more amenable to right-wing ideologies, and I mean specifically the ethno-nativist approach, or is it more amenable to left-wing, and I'm fusing that with economic-driven populism? 
Well, I think the framing that you're doing, it's it's very right one. And this is something that we also say in our book, that populism normally appears attached to something else. So if you are in a country in which socioeconomic inequalities is a big issue, but not only in the objective sense, but also that for many people on the streets, this is something that it's a real problem. And this is being politicized by a populist actor. Normally what you have is a left-wing version of populism, and this is because of the combination of populism with a sort of reinterpretation of socialism. This is Podemos or Syriza, Southern Europe, and this is most of the cases of contemporary left-wing populism in Latin America, Chavez, Morales, etc. If you go to Western Europe, although inequality has been growing, the main issue is not necessarily, although for certain sections of the electorate it is, but for many sections it's much more cultural dimension, this fear that too many immigrants are coming, the fear that the nation is evolving into a different direction, and because of that, then there is this anxiety by certain sectors of the population that it's politicized by these populist actors by using this nativism frame and combining it with populism. And then you have the right-wing version of populism. This is what we normally call the inclusionary version of populism, the left-wing one, that it's a combination of socialism and populism. And the exclusionary version is the one that we say is a combination of uh, of nativism and populism. I'm not saying that inclusionary is good and exclusionary is bad. It's just that one tries to include more people It might have certain consequences on democracy, and the exclusionary wants to exclude certain people from the nation. Okay, you said in in, uh, your answer to Dalia's, one of Dalia's first questions, that we shouldn't really uh, tie the definitions to, you know, any kind of prejudice or uh, pejorative uh, terms. And the question is, after all, is there any, uh, you know, even taking this sober and objective perspective that you offer, is there any viability for populism as a political project? Or is it just, you know, something that we will have to live with forever and will never really change the landscape, political landscape of Western democracies? Yes. Well, it's it's a good and tough question because I do think that we, thinking now in academia or political science, are very bad about doing predictions, but let's try to do my own one. I do think that populism has come to stay at least for a couple of decades, and this has to do with the transformation of the liberal democratic system. And my feeling, but this is also from many other scholars, is that this liberal democracy, in fact, it's a very peculiar system because on the one hand, we have popular sovereignty, but at the same time, we do have certain institutions that are neither elected nor controlled by we the people. Think about independent central bank, constitutional tribunals, all the international treaties, etc. A liberal democracy has been moving into the direction that the liberal component is getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and the popular component has been missing, or so to say, losing certain power. And because of that imbalance, it makes sense that now you have the populists saying, so the main problem is that this liberal component It's running a bit amok, and we want to give power back to the people. And my feeling is this problem, it has different uh, versions of that, maybe in Spain, maybe in Israel, maybe in Chile, etc. But this is happening in many places of the world. And because we do have that imbalance, my feeling is populism has come to stay in different versions in different countries. I mean, this ties into really, I think, what is the key question, which is that some of the critiques and the grievances of the populists are true. Elites and oligarchs do influence our politics and they do control them and they sometimes do plot conspiratorially against the people. I think it was a prophet, uh, Leonard Cohen, who said the rich have got their channels in the bedrooms of the poor. And maybe, like, the question is, can we agree with those grievances and address them without falling into populism? I think this is a challenge for we liberal Democrats. So if you ask me, so if you ask me personally, we I think we don't say that in the book, but I, I can say it here in the radio. I don't necessarily agree with the arguments made by the populist. It's not that I like them, but I think we need to be careful about how we understand the issues that the populists are politicizing. And if we are liberal Democrats, I think the big mistake is to start to demonizing them, saying, oh, you're just stupid, racist, bastards, whatever, you understand what is going on. Because through that way, we only generate more moralization. And remember that the populist frame, it's a moral one. The elite is bad. And probably we in academia, saying a professor that speaks languages, etc., it's part of that elite. So if I fall in that trap, it's not going to be helpful. So which is the way out? I would say that probably we need to better understand why is it that many people are voting for that forces? 
which doesn't mean that they're necessarily racist, which doesn't mean that they necessarily want to have socialism, but it has to do with certain real problems that many people are feeling. And the elites, because many of them are completely out of touch, they don't understand what is going on. So our job should be much better try to understand which are those issues. And they try to offer answers within the liberal democratic system. So I have lived in Europe for many years. I don't have European passport and always tell that to my colleagues. I think it's fine if you have someone telling you that we don't have more immigrants, which doesn't mean that we need to buy the policies that are developing, but we need to have a discussion about which type of immigration policies we do want. And probably we can engage in a discussion and you want to say, I want more, I want less, and we are going to fix quotas, whatever, but we need certain rules for that. But avoiding that discussion, it's a non-option. The same with the economic grievances. If you tell someone, oh, look at all the indicators, but the economy is running pretty well, but if you feel that the economic situation is not the right one, you can present all the data that you want, but this is not to be helpful. So we need to better understand those grievances and try to develop policies within the liberal democratic system to please certain factions of society. And what, and what about uh, Latin America? Is there any like third way that you're, uh, um, the, the one that you're offering over there? And hasn't the third way been tried and not necessarily succeeded? Yes, I think Latin America gets a bit what you are saying, that we have tried like the different version, so to say, to accommodate and didn't really work out. I think Latin America is a bit different because of the levels of economic inequality, but also because the liberal democratic system, it's not, well-established or consolidated in many of those regimes. And then what happens, like in countries or Bolivia or Venezuela, once you have these populist actors that comes into power with a lot of popularity, that actor is able to transform these institutions and move into a direction in which after a while the democratic system is not democratic anymore because it's going to be controlled by that populist leader. And then we have like much more the negative influence of populism on democracy. But this is why I think that there's an inherent... I don't know, maybe a contradiction or maybe not a contradiction. But to my mind, after reading the entire book, I sort of boiled down uh, a very simple definition. Is it okay if I propose my simple definition? Please. Maybe populism is just uh, all sorts of paths leading towards a conclusion that democracy means a tyranny of the majority. And the contradiction is that in order to have that tyranny of the majority, people uh, give their trust to one leader. How yes. does that work? Yes, I think to a certain extent it's like that. So once you have the populist figure or the populist party coming into power, so that figure is going to say, I'm the only one that is able to interpret to do the right interpretation about the majority. The problem is how the hell we are going to know what the majority wants. And here comes again, if we are a liberal Democrat, we never know. So we might done a survey and the survey tells you 50 or 60 percent wants A or B, but this is really the majority. And here comes again that populist leaders and figures are very skillful. They very often talk about the silent majority. The silent majority means that he's able to hear the real majority. I have the, divined what the true exactly, voice of the people want. But this majority is going, it's being silenced by certain minorities that don't allow to serve certain things. So this is the problem of democracy, that knowing who is the majority, what the people really want, it's a process. It's an evolution. And this is the difference between a liberal democrat and a populist, I would say. A, a liberal democrat will always try to understand what is going on and might try to fine-tune what is going and, on. And has patience for procedure and negotiation. Exactly. exactly. Well, no, no, no. I have one more question. Gilad's looking at me like we have to finish, but I always have one more question, which is that I think I need to push you to, um, or challenge you, I guess, about whether populism is more inclined to support right-wing or left-wing ideologies. And the reason I say that is because I understand that both left and right can have populist manifestations, strong centralized leadership, oppressive, even murderous policies. But I think that the inclination of populism to support an individual leader and concentrate power and create um, internal groups who are right and the power of the majority only is inherent to many right-wing ideologies, where it is you could argue, uh, you know, um, a version or a byproduct or uh, not essential to the left-wing ideologies. Or what do you think? Well, looking at different examples across the world, I tend to be a bit skeptical. And my feeling is you're absolutely right that in many of the right-wing versions of populism, we see what you were talking before. So you have decentralization of power, you have the leader that tries to move the system into one direction, let's avoid discussion, the opposition, etc. And authoritarian tendencies. Very authoritarian. But coming from Latin America, I mean, if you look at the Chavez experiment, I mean, people forget, but Chavez 
tried a coup d'etat in 1992. I mean, he was a leftist that tried to, maybe there were some reasons why people were angry with the economic system, etc. But he tried a coup d'etat, which is anything but democratic. Then he comes to power in 1998. And at the beginning, he was not that authoritarian. And here is something interesting. He becomes pretty authoritarian, I would say, because of two reasons. One is you have a commodity boom. And then, then he realized, I'm extremely rich. But on the other hand, because the opposition reacted in the worst way that you can react, and they tried a coup d'etat against him. So he realized, if my opponents are going to use all the mechanisms to throw me out, I'm going to fight back. So, But going back to your question, I think there are many cases in which you have right-wing versions of populism that tend to be very authoritarian, but unfortunately on the left you do have also similar examples. So again, I think that once you have populist figures coming into power and staying for a long stretch of time, it doesn't matter if they're left-wing or right-wing, so the possibility that the negative side of populism will pop up, it's much higher. And probably this shows to us also that populism in opposition Maybe it's not that bad, but once populist forces come into power, then the negative side or the dark side, it's much more clearer, I would say. Well, I I was hoping to end on a more positive note, (laughs) but what are you going to do, uh, uh, Professor Cristobal uh, Rivera, Count Vassa, co-author of uh, uh, Populism, a very short introduction. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation. And also many thanks to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, and to Itai Shalem and Georgia Foscarini, our producers, as well as the Israel Office of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for sponsoring this series. And now we have a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. Also, you can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has more than 500 interviews. And also, if you like what we do here, you can like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Ideas from Israel. Don't forget to follow Dalia and me on Twitter and join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from the two of us, goodbye. Goodbye.